Hello there everybody and welcome back to another episode of Anecologist Plays Ancestors, the Humankind Odyssey. We are back in prehistoric Africa. Now we're actually no longer in the Miocene era, we are now over in the uh, Pliocene. Yes, that's where we currently are. We are about 5 million years ago, no longer between the uh, Miocene, which was about 10 to 5 million years ago. Hey, right, here we go, that'll... Ooh... What a way to start the episode. So that was the stalker cat over there. Was being the operant word. Operative word. There we go. Ah, finish him. Okay. Anyway, so uh, I was actually talking about the fact that we are now in the Pliocene. And well, there we go. The uh, stalker cat just decided to come and pay us a visit. Now, I'm actually out here for a number of reasons. First of all, we want to become an omnivore today. And that's why I have got my the mushroom in my hand here. We are going to be eating it and getting, yeah, there we go, poisoned by it, which was the whole idea. And then we are going to just drink some water, uh, get rid of the poison, drink, eat the other mushroom, drink some water, get rid of the poisoning, and basically acclimatize ourselves a little bit more to the fact that we can eat mushrooms. Uh, so it doesn't, you don't need to actually eat all the mushroom species, and it turns out you also don't need to eat all the mammal meat in order to become an omnivore, but you do need to you know, get used to it a number of times by uh, eating mushrooms and then drinking water. And uh, as you do that, you will then become more tolerant of mycota, basically, uh, of the of the mushroom. So eating it without any negative side effects. Okay, so no more mushrooms on the log here. Now, fortunately, there also is no obsidian or basalt for us to make a proper chopper so that we can now go and eat the mammal meat of the Machairidus, or Amphimachairidus that we have there. Okay, so this one has two sticks. We're going to take one stick away and give it to this little guy over here. And then we are going to carry on. Now, there is a python sailing around over there as well, and we're actually now acclimatized to the oviparous meat. In other words, we can now eat the uh, snake meat without any negative consequences. We can also eat bird meat without uh, negative consequences. We actually now get nutritional value from it. Oh, there's an egg there as well. We also should be eating some eggs. We're basically going around eating eggs, mammal meat and mushrooms as much as we can, and then drinking water or just waiting for the side effects to subside. And that's how you basically then doing it a whole bunch of times. That's how you then basically become tolerant and uh, normally omnivore in the end. Way off in the distance, there is a landmark that we haven't actually explored yet, so let's head in that direction. But before we do, let's eat some of the cut leaves over here, Cata edulis. I wanted to talk about it previously, never got round to it though. Uh, but this is a plant that is found in Africa and extending all the way into the Arabian Peninsula, I do believe. And it is actually a uh, controlled substance in many different countries, uh, based on the fact that it has an effect very similar to caffeine, but far more pronounced. Let's just chase away everything in the general vicinity. And I suspect we have hyenas somewhere as well. So we are... Uh, obviously, nothing really scares us anymore. We are very well equipped with, to deal with pretty much anything coming our way, including hyenas. Ooh. Now, new interaction. Obviously, being predators, yes, they would kill one another, like they have been doing, obviously have done there. They're getting the hyena to kill the black black jackal. So that's another little evolution feat. And you can get all these different evolution feats in order to uh, progress the game and evolve further into, uh, further along in the game. Let's poke another one. And in this case, we are killing him. <laughs> so this is another evolution feat, so we are becoming more of an apex predator. I have to go around basically killing all the predators. There is an achievement for that as well. Now, they are, there's a whole pack of hyenas here. And just because we've killed the one doesn't mean that we are safe. Oh. They've actually been eating the other one, it seems. <laughs> so there's a bit of cannibalism that has gone on over there. Very, very interesting. I haven't actually seen that in the game, so that's new to me. We just go poking them constantly with normal sticks. Because we can. 
Why waste time if we can just poke them with a with a branch? Actually, not even a stick. We didn't even modify it to become a stick. We're just poking them with full-on branches. Ah, so there's obsidian over here. So this means we can now actually make ourselves a proper sharp stick and a butchering tool as well. So if we now kill another mammal, we can at least get the meat in order to progress omnivory. Okay, so there's a nice little obsidian scraper, and let's eat the meat of the ahina over here and immediately getting an upset stomach. When that has subsided, we are basically a little bit more om omnivorous, or, you know, there's a chance that the neuro neuronal pathway then will be matured, and we are then able to eat the mammal meat without suffering negative consequences. And just to show that we can, of course, now eat uh, snake meat and bird meat without any suffering, any consequences. I have just killed a green mamba, and we can now eat this entire piece of meat here without uh, getting any uh, poisoning or upset stomach because of the fact that we couldn't digest it. We are now perfectly capable of digesting and assimilating nutrients from it, which is marvelous. And this is going to happen now with the eggs. And there we go, assimilated nutrients from the oviparous kind of meat. In other words, egg-laying animals meat. We have actually gotten the nutrients and we can now, uh, you know, we can now eat the meat and get the nutrients from it. So it seems the area that I was wanting to go to is actually in the next biome, which is a desert. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, our hominid is not very well equipped to surviving the desert environment. Um, there is a... Little spot over there. There's an, uh, a meteorite that had hit the environment there. Just wanting to check whether there is another one that we can go to apart from that one. Oh, there's one in the savannah over there. I think we should actually head to the savannah. Uh, ast uh, meteorite over there. And then after our next generation leap, we'll do a quick little evolution leap, which should bring us to Australopithecus afarensis, the next hominid in the sequence. And then from there, with that species, we will head into the desert or the canyon and then the desert environment because Australopithecus afarensis should be better suited to the drier environment, at least in the game. But they were most likely not found in desert environments. They actually were in very varied habitats, mostly woodlands and grasslands and a little bit in the forest as well. Uh, no real records, I think, of them actually being in a desert environment. Australopithecus afarensis was actually more in uh, cooler temperatures. They didn't really want to be in the hot environments, or they weren't found in hot environments, they were found at higher altitudes, generally 1,000 meters above sea level and higher up. So, uh, wouldn't really be the best suited for surviving in the desert environment, which we are going to be going to, but at least in the game, they are a little bit more tolerant of the heat stress associated with the desert environment. Really no water in the desert, so we are going to have to eat some, uh, well, uh, desert melons, I think they call it, in the game and that's the only way we are going to get any water whatsoever while in the desert and even on the beach. It's one little oasis and that's right at the end. But we are going to be getting there uh, you know, soon, uh, probably in the next episode. Since we found a new fruit. Oh, I can't believe I haven't seen this one before. This looks kind of like a fig. But it is a fig! <laughs> I didn't even know figs were in the game. Oh well, that's very interesting. But uh, yeah, you'll notice the leaves over here being very much like those of a fig. <laughs> That's why I, but I thought you know it must. It looks like a fig. A fig is actually not a simple little fruit as you might imagine. It's actually a cyconium, as we call it, which is a weird type of fruit. But what is fascinating is that there are a whole bunch of little wasps living within the. Just want to get my scrape here. There are a whole bunch of wasps living within the figs themselves. So the females of those species are f uh, can fly, the males are flightless, as far as I recall. I think it's that way around. And there are some... Oh, hello, black pack jackals. We came to bash you with a rock. You came to the... Well, I came to the wrong neighborhood, I guess. But, you know, I'm just going to take over the neighborhood over here. Place them away. Yeah, go away. But within the flowers themselves, within the figs, you'll find a whole bunch of little wasps living there. And they are the main pollinators of the figs. And there's an extremely close relationship. Let's see whether we got the python to go and eat the hipparion there. Sailing right by it, surely they should be able to catch the hipparion. 
It doesn't seem like they can in the game. Okay. Well, pythons are extremely... Are able to eat actually quite large animals, much larger than you would think. And that's because their mouths obviously are able to stretch. They, they dislocate their lower jaw. Oh, the python is sailing right past me. Okay, let me just head in this direction. But they can dislocate their jaw in order to actually swallow large prey. And then their stomachs can, or their, their whole body can actually distend quite a bit as well, allowing them to eat very, very large prey animals. A bad thing, of course, if you have just eaten such a massive meal, like, you know, after Christmas or Easter or whenever, you are not really very energetic. So they tend to eat a very large meal, and then they are very, very lethargic, and they kind of just chill in an area and digest their food, which takes a relatively long time. But back to the figs <laughs> and the wasps. I get sidetracked so easily, as all my students can attest to that fact. Uh, and uh, again, of course, we are exploring a bit, so we are... Finally getting the... Oh, there's another place we haven't explored yet. Oh, wonderful. But we're finally having to conquer our fear again, which is the first time in quite a while that we have to do this again. But we are going to, of course, as we head into the desert, we are going to find a whole bunch of new environments that we have to discover and face our fears with. Uh, let's just quickly do that. This is the Pond and Puddle Oasis. <laughs> I guess this is the pond. Not sure where the puddle is. Uh, it's probably going to be... Just to the side here, there we go, there's the puddle. So the pond and the puddle oasis. <laughs> uh, cute, okay. Now back to the fig and wasps. I find it extremely fascinating as uh, it's an extremely close relationship between the wasps and the figs. So what you have is that, let's say there's a female of one of these fig wasps, as they are called. Now there are two main types. There are some that pollinate the figs and there are others that don't pollinate the figs and either parasitize the figs or parasitize the, uh, this little Ampish Makari that's up there, or they parasitize the wasps that do pollinate the figs. And here's another little fig tree over here as well, okay, and we can just chase the Dorcas gazelles away. So in one of those fruit, before the fruit actually forms, so inside one of those psychonia, psychonia as we call it, go away, I'm trying to talk about figs, what? Well, you don't going to go away, I'm going to bash you with a rock. There we go. You don't want to go away? Now you get bashed. Now you run away. Anybody else? Oh, you guys really aren't scared of the hominid running around here, eh? But inside one of these figs, before it actually gets pollinated, it's you know just the harder shell on the outside, and then inside there are a whole bunch of little flowers, individual little flowers, that form, if you break open a fig, it forms those fibers you typically see. Oh, another one wants to interrupt the talk on figs. Go away. And then a little, there's a little hole at the bottom of that... Uh, oh, there are hyenas. Oh, hello. <laughs> there's no rest for me, eh? Come on, I'm going to chase you away. Bash you again. There we go. Come. Let's finish the job. There. You can't interrupt my speech if you are no longer alive. Okay, it's quite brutal, but there we go. So, at the bottom of a fig, and you can see this actually quite easily. Might as well butcher this while we are here. Uh, you can see a little hole, a little opening. So, let's say there's a female that is pregnant. So, she's got eggs. She can now enter through that little hole. And she then lays an egg inside one of those little individual flowers within the fig, uh, before the fig actually is pollinated. As she enters, she brings pollen from the fig that she was in, that she hatched in. She then lays an egg in there, and this is now when a whole bunch of other little wasps can come in and actually parasitize her egg. I don't want the bone, I'm going to throw the bone far away in the direction of that hyena over there. But then, as I was trying to say, here we are very close to the meteorite, just over the ridge here. But so a whole bunch of other little ones can actually try to parasitize those eggs and lay their own eggs in the flower that is, you know, being, that has been parasitized or has been had an egg laid in by one of those little pollinating wasps. The drying basin oasis. Okay, so. Quite beautiful, a little bit of greenery in the relatively arid savanna that we are looking at.
And there are some hippos that are also here, quite close to where we are. Okay, we must be careful. We are here at a drying pond. And there are a whole bunch of hippos that are also in the area, but we are going to, we need to drink. So we are going to risk it. With uh, all the hippos in the general vicinity, not the place we really want to be. Now, this, of course, does happen when you have a the dry season rolling into an area with hippos congregating or being forced into these tiny little puddles. Uh, during those times, it gets extremely uh, fierce, the competition between individuals, and you'll have a lot of fighting happening, especially between bulls. And, of course, it's the dangerous time for us, most dangerous time for us to come and drink water close to a, a puddle like this because we really are going to be, you, you would be quite close to a whole bunch of, one of some of these hippos. The interesting with the hippos here, the hippopotamus gorgops, uh, they weigh about double the weight of the hippos, the Nile hippos that we have alive today. So they were really, really massive. So our hippos today weigh about 2,000 kilograms, sometimes 2,500 kilograms when fully grown. Uh, these hippos weighed about 4,000 kilograms when they were fully grown, which is very, very large. Just checking to see whether there is a new tree in the area. Should be. Does look like that could be a new species for us. There's a black mamba here. I'm really tired of hearing him hiss at us the whole time, so we're just going to get rid of him. Yeah. I really wouldn't be grabbing a mamba like that and you're bashing him with a rock. Of course, these hominids are superhuman uh, or super hominid, uh, so uh, they obviously can do it. Aha! So this tree over here, I would recognize that bark anywhere. Uh, if you look up in the tree, see, we've got a whole bunch of new fruit up there. Now, this would be a marula, which is definitely one of my favorite plants. And it has an amazing fruit as well. I really do love the taste thereof. Yes, we must obviously first smell and detect whether it is edible. This is. They generally form these clusters of yellowish plump fruit. Uh, the dark one over there shouldn't be ripe anymore i think that's overripe but we're going to eat it in any case just because we can unfortunately the marula there was extremely overripe so uh, we are now really really intoxicated it seems here oh we no we're still intoxicated i'm not sure whether we have you have heard this myth but there is a myth of uh, marula fruit falling out of the tree landing on the ground and then fermenting and as it ferments it creates alcohol which the uh, animals then eat and they become extremely drunk now, that is, unfortunately, just a myth. It doesn't happen in real life. Oh, we need to just quickly explore up here. So it doesn't really happen in real life, although the way it came from was actually a movie called Beautiful People, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I think that's actually, to some extent, where I get my hello when I start the video, where I say hello, all you beautiful people. I think that's kind of where I come from, with, where I get that from. Just get rid of this python over here as well, Python Sabay. So that's another snake that is no longer with us. But there is the movie, uh, an old South African movie, I think it was, uh, called Beautiful People, where in that movie, the people actually, or the animals eat the fermenting marula fruit, and in the process they become drunk, and then they fall around, pass out, and stuff like that. Uh, and a lot of people seem to think that you can, you know, that can happen if animals eat a lot of fermented marula fruit. But in actual fact, what happened was those are just animals that were tranquilized uh, for game capture or whatever other purposes. And so they were just filmed as they were you know, being drowsy and falling over with the tranquilizing that happened with them for the, with the capture. And so you can't, you know, animals can't get drunk by eating marula fruit. It would have been very funny if they could, but they can't. Right, so we've got the drying waterfall over here, which you can see there is a bit of moisture up on the rocks there, but there's no moisture down on the ground, so there's a little waterfall. And then as it moves over there, you have that little oasis there, which is the drying basin oasis. Okay, we are really risking it again, but the sun is baking down on us, so uh, or beating down on us, so we need to actually uh, drink some water. The hippos are right there, they're probably not going to be too happy with us. Now, hippos, although largely herbivorous, they will, of course, eat meat occasionally. Uh, and they have got massive canines, which, of course, they use to fight one another rather than you know, catch prey animals. They have these massive tusks, which I'm sure we can see if we actually go closer. But we don't really want to go closer to the massive hippos there. And, uh, yeah, they come out onto land, of course, to graze. 
And that's why, oh there we go, yawning, that's a kind of a display. To show, look at my beautiful, magnificent, dangerous tusks, now go away. Now, back to the figs, of course, because I've been trying to speak about figs for a very, very long time. And let's talk about figs while we head into that direction over there. Head over to that landmark, which we have to discover as well. So, with a fig, so as I was saying earlier, let's say there's a female that has eggs, or wants to lay eggs, she goes into the nest, into the fig, and she lays an egg in the fig. Uh, she lays it in one of the single individual flowers within hello little horses within the fig itself that egg will now of course develop and there are a whole bunch of little other ones that also do this and so they are eventually the eggs hatch which will then have males and females and you will then have oh we already come okay we can already just go and conquer our fear there you'll then have a whole bunch of males and females now the males when they hatch they try to mate with the females not usually before the females even hatch which I think it's a little bit bad, but in any case, not going to say what that sounds like, but in you know, any case. So uh, they can mate the females before the females actually hatch. The females, in other words, hatch already pregnant, which, which is one way to start life. And uh, what happens then is the female then has to crawl out. Now, the at that point, the hole through which she entered would have closed off, which makes it almost impossible for her to actually go out. The males, however, in the meantime, would have also tried digging out. They, they, that creates a hole, or holes through the fig, which the female can then exit through. While we are discovering this point, let's continue talking. This little landmark here, which is called the what? This place is called the Raised Refuge Oasis. Okay, brilliant. Now, the females, of course, then try to or basically dig out through the fig, and this creates a new hole for the females to go out through. The males, as soon as they get outside, basically die. Um, they've served their purpose in life. The female that had originally laid the egg inside the fig also dies. Uh, she has accomplished her life of uh, her uh, objective of reproducing. So they are what we call some malparous organisms. They reproduce once and then they die. They don't reproduce, reproduce more than once in their lifetime. And so those uh, males, of course, as I've said, they die once they have made their journey through. So the females then, of course, will worm her way out through the holes that the males have created. And then she's able to fly off to another environment, another fig that she can go and have a look for. She finds it, she crawls in through the hole that is in the fig. As she does that, her um, wings actually fall off, so she again can't exit and fly off again. She lays another egg in there, and as she has crawled out through the hole of the pre in the previous fig, she has gotten pollen on her, and then of course as she crawls in through the new fig, she pollinates that flower, or that, that flower, that psychonium, that inflorescence. It's quite an amazing, there are a whole bunch of species of uh, fig wasps, and of course a whole bunch of figs that are pollinated by them. So we're just going to climb up the mountainside here, probably going to be half dead by the time we get to the top here, but in any way we have to make the journey up, there's a site for us to have a look at. Uh, but anyway, as I was saying, I find it fascinating, the, the figs and the wasps and the interactions between them. Um, you know, nature really just is amazing. Oh, this is a very nice little green spot. This looks like part of the woodland that we were in previously. Really on par for habitat that this hominid would have lived in. And it is the leaning trunk oasis of the woodland. So now we are... Yeah, kind of back where we originally were when we were before we came into the savannah. This is one of the ways you can, of course, enter the savannah is by jumping down here. I think we were on our way here previously, and then we, did a, you know, went back to get the family, and then we came along the the door to the savannah, which is a different route to the savannah. Okay, so we can actually head back to our oh well our oasis, which is quite some distance away. Have a look. Right, we're right on the edge here. Let's have a look what we can see. Our oasis, our settlement is way over there. Okay, quite a distance away. I think I'm going to head there. Let's just jump down. If being careful not to die as we make our way down or nor break our legs. We already have drunk some water, so we are protected against the sun. We are perfectly capable of running over to that 
settlement of ours. If we don't get lost along the way. Although it's straight in that direction, shouldn't be a problem. I'll be back in a moment. Okay, so I have, on the way, killed a Dorcas gazelle. Mainly because I want to eat the mammal meat over here so that we can actually become a little bit more omnivorous. We also have a new landmark up there, which we haven't visited before. Uh, we're actually going to make our way up there quickly. Maybe some mushrooms over there as well, some mycota, uh, which we are also going to go for. And uh, then we can make our way back to our settlement on the other side over there. Oh, matured neuron. We are now able to get the neuron for omnivory in terms of mammal meat. So that should make us a little bit more omnivorous. If we can just get some more mushrooms, we really... <laughs> oh, that sounds like an interesting thing to say. But if we can only get some more mushrooms now, we really would be able to become very much omnivorous. Oh, this would be amazing if we could do that today. And this spot that we have over here, also still part of the woodland, this is the Savannah's Border Oasis. So this is probably one of the last oases that you normally would go through as you pass into the Savannah biome. So this is still right up against the mountain. We still have a bit of moisture that's accumulating here in the form of rain or fog or something. And uh, as a result, you have got greener environment over here, some more trees, quite beautiful. And then you start heading into the drier uh, savannah. They also have a nice little cave system over here. Not really a cave system, but an overhang. And overhangs like these would have been where a lot of early humans also would have had their little uh, places where they would have the cave art. Potentially, at least, depending on how well preserved or how well it would be. Yeah. Now we're actually heading back to where we had previously been. This is the outcrop that is most likely was a... It most likely is some kind of uh, volcanic dike that has formed here. And that's because down here there are areas that we haven't actually explored. There are actually three landmarks. There's one there. And then there are actually a whole bunch over there that we haven't, you know, four over there that we haven't actually uh, re looked at before or discovered. So we're just going to be doing that. And uh, hopefully, hopefully there are some fungi that we can eat somewhere around here as well. So this is, oh, there should be some mushrooms over here. But there are also our glowworms. Notice all these threads kind of glowing around as well. Uh, this is, I'm not sure what order of insect it would be, but these are worm-like creatures that live way up there, and then they form these silken threads that come down, and they glow, they're bioluminescent. And the idea is that they will catch moths and other little insects that are attracted to the light, and uh, they then reel them up and eat them. So they're predators, they're predatory, in the, in the, and they use the carry a rock for protection, just in case there is something in here. And they then basically catch their prey uh, by attracting them with the light. So there's a, a lure that they are producing there. Oh yes, there's a new fungus for us. But this is going to, this is going to hurt. Um, that's all I can say. This is, this is not edible. Now notice it's growing on a whole bunch of moths that are stuck to the wall over here. Now these are some kind of cordyceps mushroom. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let's say intimo, this is something to do with eating an insect. So there's a moth, we're looking at the cordyceps mushroom that's growing out, bursting out of the head there. Uh, entomopathic, entomopathogenic fung uh, fungus, Isaria. Okay, so it's not a, a cordyceps per se, interesting, but it is going to, oh, it hasn't actually hurt us, okay. I was expecting it's going to hurt us quite a bit. We're just going to keep on eating until we become poisoned, become poisoned by it. There we go. Ooh, that hurt. Uh, this is going to take quite a while for us to actually get rid of. So I'm just going to keep on drinking water in front here until we actually feel better. And then we're going to eat some more. Because why not? Um, so basically... The entomo pathogenic, pathogenic meaning disease causing and entomo referring to insects. So this is an, a fungus that basically kills insects. Um, so this is probably in the cordyceps group. I'll have to look up Isaria, the, the genus that this fungus belongs to. 
But with the cordyceps mushrooms or cordyceps fungi, what they actually do is they, they're very famous for attacking ants, but the whole bunch of insects are you know, affected by them. But we as humans are, as far as I know, not affected by them. But what they basically do is they are ingested somehow by the insect. But in the case of ants, they then control the ants to climb up to a high spot and they kill the ant. And then they have this fungus, this mushroom, bursting out of the head of the ant. And that fung mushroom then spreads the spores, which can infect new individuals of the colony, for example. And uh, it just keeps on spreading in that way. So it's to some extent a mind-controlling fungus. And uh, not very, very pleasant. And you'll find amazing footage of the cordyceps fungus or cordyceps mushroom attacking insects on... on YouTube, amongst other places. The BBC have done some, or David Attenborough has done some amazing uh, documentary basically with him. Oh, okay, let's see. Any other mushrooms for us to eat? Because we're still not. Uh, oh, there we go. There's another Scolopendra. Oof, we have been envenomated. Not pleasant. Okay, we really needed a stick to try and. Get rid of the Megarian bandit centipedes, Colopendra. Anyway, so we are now <laughs> suffering from wave venom, which is not going to be cured by drinking water. So let's head back. There are some coconuts in the front there. Eh? I'll quickly cure myself that way. Back in a flash. But if you are suffering from venom, like that one there, you just go and grab a coconut and you bash it open. Not in real life, but in this game. <laughs> you would bash it open. Uh, and then drink the juice inside there, and that's going to hopefully get rid of the venom. There we go. Okay, a little bit at least. Drop that. Get another one. Bash it open as well. And drink it as well. Now we should be quite alright. There we go. Oh, finally, we can see normally again. Well, it seems we did not make it back to our settlement today after all, but we are here at the Buried Garden Oasis and this is where we are going to end today's episode. Join me next time as we hopefully become completely omnivorous. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like below. Also remember to subscribe if you haven't yet. It really helps the channel to grow. And uh, you know, if you enjoyed it, share with your friends. Let the word spread that we are here to educate through entertainment. So until next time, stay safe. I will see you all soon.